Chapter 12, The Fuzzy and Puffy Fan Club. Once again at school on Monday morning, Fuzzy and Puffy were the big topic of conversation. This week, however, no one was laughing. Although last Saturday's episode had definitely been the most laughable of them all. Not so much as a snicker was heard. In the Centennial Park schoolyard, the students gathered in small groups, speaking in hushed voices as they were as if they were in a funeral parlor. From the fourth grade up, every single person had suffered through a conference with the Venice Menace last week. An uneasiness was about <clears throat> what was coming next hung over them like a cloud. Look at them, said Mark. They're acting like somebody died. Somebody almost did, said Benji bitterly. You! Ah, oh, come on. Benji, you told me to knock out the professor's radio. You didn't say anything about what I should do afterwards. Yeah, because I didn't think I had to, snapped Benji. Only a true deranged idiot would think of blow drying a puddle. It made waves and everything, Mark reminisced. It also knocked out the WGRK transmitter when Winston Churchill was perfect, beautiful, wonderful. Oh, shut up, Benji, said Ellen Louise. Aren't you forgetting something? If it wasn't for your brilliant idea to use the independent research assignment for a quiz, there wouldn't have even been a hairdryer. You deserve what happened Saturday. And as for Winston Churchill, I don't care if we're stuck with him forever. I love him. Then buy him yourself, growled Benji. It's not what we want. It's what Mr. Whitehead wants. Selling pets is his business and keeping him happy is our business. We're in a tough business, said Mark. The bell rang and heads began to look this way and that, scanning the playground for the Venice Menace. A murmur went up and there were faint stirrings of hope. They're just going to be disappointed, said Benji. He's probably lurking somewhere inside with more blue sheets. If that's true, then I'm going to going in through the ventilation duct, promised Mark. But Brad was nowhere to be found and it was a happy school that filed to its classrooms for the start of the day. Benji shrugged. Maybe he's sick. Are you kidding, said Mark. If you were a germ, would you have the guts to attack Jaworski? Mrs. Pentagopoulos was already in the classroom as the students of fifth grade seminar filed in. She addressed the three producers. I missed your show again this weekend. Can you believe it? Gee, that's too bad, beamed Mark. At least something had gone right. She shook her head. I was tuned to the right station and I heard you, Mark, for about three seconds. And then I got nothing but static and white noise. There's a lot of that going around, said Ellen Louise. Benji glared at her. The teacher slapped her dust. What I can't understand is that my reception is perfect now. It was just your show. I'm beginning to think that I really do hate this radio. Maybe that's why the first guy returned it, suggested Mark. At that moment, the principal, Mr. Sword, came on the PA system with the morning announcements. He gave us his usual pep talk on keep your washrooms clean, and then he said, now I'd like to introduce to you a young man who has asked for the opportunity to talk to you today. The staff and I are extremely proud of the initiative this sixth grader has shown lately. So please give your full attention to Brad Jaworski. It was as though the school building itself gasped. In every single classroom, you could hear a pin drop as an all too familiar throat was cleared over the speakers. <clears throat> it's me, came Brad's surly voice. I didn't go out in the schoolyard because I didn't want to be mobbed. Got it? I knew my stories were popular, but until I met with somebody last week, I had no idea how famous I was getting. Since everybody loves my writing so much, I expect to see a lot of posters and signs and t-shirts and stuff. And pictures, lots of pictures. Use your imagination. Now, if you don't do these things, I'll know that you've been snowing me about my stories and you don't really like them at all. Then I'll feel bad. I don't like to feel bad. Got it? Mr. Sword's voice was heard again. Uh, uh, Brad? Perhaps some people might uh, misunderstand the friendly nature of your message. Oh, no, sir, said the Venice Menace. I think everybody understands my message perfectly. There was a long, audible sigh throughout the school. 
The three producers exchanged looks of pure agony. The pit rumbled. I've been hearing a lot about this Brad lately, said Mrs. Panagopoulos. I haven't read any of his work yet, but he must be really be someone to watch out for. Oh, he is, said Benji sadly. The teacher snapped her fingers. We need to do more creative writing. We need to do more creative hiding, came a voice from the pit. So the invented writer's round table and, <clears throat> and wrote list of objectives in large letters on the blackboard, followed by the numbers one through 20. Number one, she announced pleasantly, psycholiterary growth. This is where I stop paying attention. Mark whispered to Benji, don't be scared. I figured out the seminar. We do the same stuff as everybody else does in a regular class, only we have to call it by big, fancy, messed up names like Writer's Round Table. Just means we have to do compositions, which is a bummer, but we always get that stuff anyway. So let her talk. Just grab a nap. I'm not worried about that, Benji hissed. I'm worried about Jaworski. That little speech was as plain as the nose on your face. Everybody who doesn't do a poster, a picture, or make a big deal with Fuzzy and Puffy gets his face kicked in, and it doesn't help him to have Mr. Sword acting like it's okay with him. Mark nodded. The teachers are probably so thrilled that Jaworski, king of the straight F report card, is finally interested in something that they don't notice that he's holding the whole school for ransom. But what are we going to do, asked Benji. Take my advice, said Mark. At recess, we hit the art room and start working on the biggest fuzzy and puffy poster you've ever seen. At recess, the line to get into the art room stretched down the hall and around the corner past the music room. This is the craziest thing I've see ever seen in my life, said Ellen Louise in disgust. I was worried about poor Brad, but I'm not worried anymore. He should be locked up for this. Bad enough? He subjects everybody to his stupid stories, but to terrify the whole school into forming the Puffy and Fuzzy and Puffy fan club? Mark pointed to a tall, slim girl a few places up the line. Hey, isn't she one of the pit people? I can never recognize them on ground level. Benji watched the fortunate few from the front of the line scampering off with their art supplies. He gawked at a group of boys from the other fifth grade class as they decided the wait would be too long, ripped off their t-shirts and wrote, I heart fuzzy and puffy and bl black magic marker across the fronts. Some sixth grade girls who wore makeup were off in a corner applying eyeline whiskers to their cheeks. I can't believe this, Benji wailed, fingers wrapped in his curls. Look at this lineup. You'd think someone was giving away free money. I mean, come on, has the whole world gone nuts? Benji, calm down, Mark hissed. It was our show, too. <clears throat> That's where it, when it started, and three miserable weeks ago when Mrs. Harris was so impressed by that story. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Harris. You're a great teacher with a real eye for talent. Ellen Louise grabbed him by the shoulders. Shh, Benji, everybody's staring at you. He looked at her helplessly. All right, she went on. This has gone far enough. There's no reason for us to bust our heads over this. We've got the best staff advisor in the world. Benji slapped his forehead. Of course, Mr. Moritz. Why didn't I think of it? Mark sighed with relief. Our troubles are over. Speaking to Mr. Moritz was wonderful for Benji. It felt so good to get the whole story off his chest. Going back to the first day they had seen Brad's name on the sign-up sheet, all the way to the line of students in front of the art room. The producers told it all. Mr. Morantz had his head buried in a copy of Have Laser Will Travel, but he was listening all right. Benji could tell because he was nodding and saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, in all the right places. In addition, the teacher's award plaques and trophies lined the gym wall. It made Benji feel more confident than ever. So, Mr. Morantz, he finished. What should we do? Mr. Morantz didn't look up. What will you kids learn if I solve your problems for you? Oh, Mr. Morantz, said Ellen Louise, we know you like us to work things out for ourselves, but this could turn into a real disaster and we just don't know what to do. Please help us. Painfully, the gym teacher tore his eyes from his book to notice that three producers were still there. 
Hadn't his answer been enough for them? Recess was almost over and he'd only gotten through half a chapter. Running out of time, he mumbled plaintively. Benji looked confused and then the whole face lit up. You mean we should schedule Brad last and then run out of time before he has a chance to get on the air? Mr. M Morris waved his hand. Hmm, now would they go away? Wow, exclaimed Benji as the three hurried back to class. He's a genius. Oh, he is, agreed Ellen Louise. He knows more about education than anybody, except maybe Mrs. Panagopoulos. Notice the way he makes us think for ourselves most of the time. But when we really need it, he steps in and gives us the perfect idea. I'm not so sure about the idea, said Mark. What do we do if Jaworski doesn't want to go on last? That's no problem, said Benji. He thinks he's the best part of the whole show. Well, it's only sensible to save the best for last. It even says so in broadcasting is my life. Well, he still might kill us when we run out of time, Mark persisted. Of course he won't, said Benji confidently. Mr. Morantz is behind us all the way. After all, this is his idea. By Wednesday, the sign on the lawn read, Welcome to Centennial Park School, home of Fuzzy and Puffy. The building was hung with posters, banners, and pennants, all proclaiming support for J Brad Jaworski's writing. Inside, the school halls were worse. Every square inch of wall space was taken up with illustrations of kittens in combat. Classroom doors bore slogans like, 4C supports Puffy, 6A for Puffy, for Fuzzy, and of course, the middle of the rotors, fifth grade seminar, likes them both. Even the washrooms were not immune. In the corner stall of the boys was a spectacular paper mache model of the famous toilet dunking scene from last week's Kids View. The students themselves looked much like the walls, slogans from head to toe, Ball ca baseball caps, t-shirts, blue jean pockets, scarves, and sneakers were festooned with the names of Brad's two characters. One sixth grader had Puffy written in cotton balls down one leg and Fuzzy in shag carpeting down the other. A pyramid of empty cat food tents was under construction in the pit, topped by a sign which read, Sister Agnes Claire, unfair to Puffy. Kitty litter covered the floor like sawdust. <clears throat> Through it all patrolled Brad Jaworski neither approving nor disapproving, and smiling not at all. Constantly, he would call on people to explain their work, ask grilling questions, and then pass on without comment. Many of the students would actually have been enjoying themselves if it hadn't been for the constant pressure from Pred's presence. The Venice Menace could spot an undecorated person from halfway across a crowded schoolyard. Hey, I guess you don't like my writing very much. I'm beginning to feel bad. Gee, no, Brad, you've got it all wrong. My fuzzy and puffy poncho is in the wash. Raised eyebrows. You only have one? Yeah, but I also did the picture near the second floor washroom. Frown. That's been there since Monday. You haven't done anything since Monday? It was enough to make even the bravest person paint cat pictures on his most expensive shirt, which is why the student body of Centennial Park School looked like guests at a giant costume party where no one was having a good time. On Thursday night, Benji paused in Aaron's doorway as he usually did to bid his sister good night. She was sitting on the floor playing contentedly with two stuffed animals. Suddenly, she let loose a fierce battle cry. One toy attacked the other and a vicious fight began. Watching Thunderstruck, Benji realized what the two toys were supposed to be kittens. Fuzzy and Puffy, Brad Jaworski's horrible stories had managed to reach Benji's innocent little sister. Puffy was pounding Fuzzy's head and the stuffing was beginning to fly. No, no, kid, stop! He walked in and grabbed the two animals. Where'd you learn stuff like that anyway? Kid boo? Kids view? Oh no. Little babies all over town were learning about paw to paw, paw count combat thanks to the show. Benji threw the toys in the closet stuck a music box in her hand and deposited her in her crib. Aaron looked resentfully. Puzzy, Fuffy. No more Puzzy and Fuffy, kid. It was true. The next bloodthirsty episode was not going to make it to the air. 
courtesy of Mr. Morenz's brilliant plan. Every time Benji had passed the Kids View staff advisor in the hall this week, he had flashed him the thumbs up signal. Naturally, Mr. Morantz had seemed to be completely absorbed in his reading and he had not responded. Cool as a cucumber, that Mr. Morantz. A week without Fuzzy and Puffy just might give the whole miserable business a chance to die out. <coughs> Mark would go on hair drying duty again outside Mrs. Pentagopoulos' apartment, which took care of the quiz. Weston Churchill would be fine so as long as Mark didn't blow dry any more puddles. Benji didn't say it aloud, but he didn't even let the thought form completely in his mind. But out of the fuzzy and puffy reign of terror, the Winston Churchill catastrophe, and the hassles of life in a seminar instead of a class, it seemed that maybe, just maybe, things might be looking up.